ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thank you very much indeed for giving up uh, your afternoon to be here in this magnificent church. I, I'm feeling very empowered here since I believe some uh, priests and others will have given incredibly powerful talks in the past, but I don't know whether I can uh, achieve that today. But I think it's important you understand that I'm not a, a doctor that treats patients with ME. So in terms of individual life stories, which each of you have, um, what I can, how I can respond will have to be from where I come from. And where I come from is 40 years, really, in medical research. Um, I was one of the people who helped found the medical school in Southampton 40 years ago. And I spent my life, really, there researching lung disease not this area. So in a way, why I've come in to try and see what I can do in this area is because of what I've learned during that period of working in complicated lung diseases and the advances that we've been able to make. So that is the reason I'm standing here in front of you. I'm also very heavily involved uh, with the Medical Research Council and the funding of research generally, and that also helps, obviously, if you want to promote an area of medical science. My talk really is about mechanisms, and I think the first thing I want to say uh, is that I think the scientific and medical world have now accepted fully that this group of conditions exists. Now, you may think that's an odd thing to say, but I'm sure all of you at different times have had difficulties in convincing people, particularly the medical profession, that you've got a problem and that problem needs some sort of management. But I believe now we have got to a point where it is accepted and I'm you know, delighted about that. Now how we describe it and how we define it is important and on the right hand side there there's a, a really very pragmatic description which tries to pick up some of the main features of this condition. And each of you here, if you have the condition, or a family, or a relative with it, will recognize some components of that in varying, varying amounts. It's by no means comprehensive. I think the first thing to say is that this is a lot more common than we previously appreciated. Also, which I think is now influencing the way that the medical profession is looking at it, it is recognized as an important cause of school absenteeism, absenteeism from work, and lack of engagement with uh, sporting and other activities in life. It is a disabling condition, particularly at the more severe end of the spectrum. The reason I'm interested in it is that treatments really are ineffective uh, in large part. I mean, they are helpful but do not actually seem to affect the disease in terms of its underlying cause or causes. And I'll come back to that later. And then finally, research has been a nightmare. There are as many theories about this group of conditions as there are people with it. And I think that's been part of the problem because there's been so many zealots in the area thinking that their idea is the one that's uh, the cause. And we've had several quite unpleasant false starts which have been very uh, troublesome, I think, when people think that they have uncovered the cause of the disease. Well, a mile and a half uh, from where I live, Florence Nightingale is buried. And uh, when she died, uh, it was interesting that they, thousands of people turned up for her funeral, but she only allowed four people to come to the little church, which is much smaller than this since it can only house about 30 people. And she was a very humble woman, and you'll see her gravestone there in West Willow Church. It's just got FM, Florence Nightingale. But the thing about Florence Nightingale is that she did probably have this condition, and many of you will probably know this. But her contributions post-nursing were enormous because she did a degree in mathematics and was one of the first statisticians, really, to uh, start uh, quantifying population-based uh, data for analysis of medical and other uh, uses. So 
Although she couldn't go out of her house, um, when she got back, she had a very, very fruitful life in this other world. I don't think any of you have managed to see this report. It's only just come out, actually. It's come from the Action for ME. Uh, it's a survey of patients, basically, trying to find out more about what their perspectives are. And they ask people about their symptoms. And listed there, you'll see uh, grades of severity in different colours. But what really surprised me was that patients themselves uh, gauge their own disability with this condition in a very high proportion of cases. I mean, a fifth or more of people with this condition are suggesting that they are severely affected. And of course, the definition of severe we can talk about for ages. But it, it does mean that this is a really serious and, and important cause of disability. Of course, we know it can be a devastating and long-lasting illness. But we also know that sometimes it can disappear as quickly as it arrives. And the biology of that is totally unknown, why it disappears. We also know that seeing general practitioners is only of certain, certain help, if they can help you. But the problem is, if once you run out of that currency, the relationship with primary health care tends sometimes to be somewhat strained, because they can't offer anything more than they probably have been able to do previously. An important aspect of this is how the individuals able to function socially in life. And of course, uh, more than a quarter, 27%, uh, who have applied for employment and support allowance in the past, had their benefit reduced. This is serious, and this is upsetting, and needs to be challenged. To me, what's disappointing, really, uh, and that's why I'm here talking to you, is that when we compare 2008, which is in yellow, I think, here, with 2014, the treatments for this group of conditions has changed very little. And that, that diagram there just shows the difference between 2008 and 2014. In other words, we haven't got anything really new that's come in in the last five or ten years that's really making a major difference to people's lives. And that's important. There is also another um, difficulty which I think we have to face, and you, you obviously have faced it, I would think, in that when we ask patients about this condition, they inevitably say they believe it's a physical condition. But then when we go to um, media or we go to uh, the medical profession, they tend to err on the side of psychiatric, psychological and other related Causes. And that causes an enormous amount of upset in patients because they firmly believe there's a physical cause of the condition. But of course, so far, nobody's been able to fill in that black box of what this physical condition really is, other than describing it in terms of symptoms. So we have a problem, a perception problem, and the only way we're going to be able to solve this is by delving into it through research by demonstrating certain things have gone wrong. So, what would patients like? Well, it's obvious, and I won't read any of those things out for you because I'm sure any one of those boxes could be you. You want to be cured with this condition. And uh, that is the highest level that we as scientists and clinicians should be trying to achieve. And so far, haven't. So how are we going to get to that particular level? How are we going to start beginning to get to a point when we can say, well, you have this type of ME, this is the treatment you need to stop the process? Because we're not there yet by any means. And what I want to try and illustrate to you is that we need a completely different approach. We've got problems difficulty in recognition, the fact that it's been, caused, uh, it's been called a single disease hasn't helped in any way. And we use these words like ME and chronic fatigue syndrome, or even 
uh, another one, Fibromyalgia Rheumatica. And of course, there are overlaps between them all, but they have largely been regarded as single diseases, and they're not single diseases. And that's been the problem in large part. And I'll come back to that principle in a few moments. Disagreements over mechanisms, it's a complex disorder, like many complicated um, uh, lifelong disorders, such as arthritis, or such as chronic obstructive lung disease, or such as multiple sclerosis, difficult, complex, multiple issues involved in them. Very few treatments available. The quality of research underpinning this group of conditions is really quite poor, largely due to only small numbers of patients being studied and people uh, not really knowing quite what to study to define under, uh, underlying principles of how the disease may be manifesting. This whole issue of trust, which has been a very difficult thing, low level of research funding, partly because not enough researchers are engaged in it, but also because there are all these other complicated interacting issues that have confounded people uh, who are interested in research from going into it, and lack of the pharmaceutical or biotechnology industry in wanting to get engaged. So how can we, how can we sort of park all that stuff and start again, because my belief is that's what is needed here. We've just got to forget all that stuff that went in the past, draw a line under it all, saying it hasn't delivered the goods, and let's now try and think of a new way of, of getting to the underlying uh, disease processes. Now this, uh, talking about Florence Nightingale, this happened uh, 150 odd years ago in medicine generally, when one man, this man William Osler, Canadian, um, really revolutionized medicine by putting the science into medicine. Because prior to him, medicine was more of an art than it was a science. And what he did was uh, he dissected bodies, he studied disease, he studied underlying disease processes, and as a result of that, he wrote the first textbook of medicine in 1892 called The Principles and Practice of Medicine, which is now in its 67th edition. So he, in a way, I suppose, liberated medicine through science, through understanding disease processes. And that's what happened. And he went on to, to found a medical school called the Johns Hopkins Medical School in Baltimore before he came to Oxford uh, uh, when he was 59 and became the Regis Professor of Medicine there. So the reason I'm lingering on this history a little bit is it's quite important because this was really where we as a medical profession in the last 150 years have functioned by combining clinical observation with pathological understanding of cellular processes, putting them together and then diagnosing disease and identifying ways to treat. But it's really not delivering any longer in the way that we would like it to deliver. So we're now left with a bunch of diseases out there where progress is really not as fast as they should be. So osteoporosis, Alzheimer's dementia, um, I can go on and on and on and on, but we're, we're left with diseases where the low-hanging fruit of applying the Osler principles of managed to uh, identify causes and enable treatments <laughs> to emerge, but now we've got the difficult stuff that's left. And, and I would put uh, Emmy, right in the heart of that room, really. it's, it's difficult because nobody really understands quite how to move it forward. And it's not the only disease like that. I mean, there are many others, you know, in that situation. Um, I think you're a bit more vulnerable because you've had such a hard fight to get the profession to recognize it in the first place, but they do recognize it now, so we can move forward. So we're, we're stuck really with a very difficult paradigm in medicine where we've got all this chronic disease out there and we're living a little bit longer than we used to. We've got lots of lifestyle issues which come with urbanization and the way we you know, live our lives. And the question is how are we going to understand to move on beyond just uh, palliating these diseases like osteoporosis or, or dementia? How are we going to manage them uh, causatively. The situation is confounded by the fact that our uh, 
industry that provides treatments are packing up their bags and leaving because it's become too difficult. So if we just take a, a, the development of one drug to go into the clinic, it costs $1.3 billion to get one drug into the clinic from its from discovery. And you've got to be incredibly wealthy as a company to be able to afford that. Because um, we've created all this regulation and all this um, uh, difficult journey such that it takes over 10 years to get one drug into a patient. And this is meaning that many pharmaceutical companies are collapsing. And we've been witness witnessing some of that recently, I think. Um, but there is optimism here. So what's happened in the last five to seven years is that a new biology is emerging. And this is driven through technology, through scientific technology. And this is the ability to interrogate, to study very complicated things by coming at them from the reverse direction. I'll explain that in a second. In a way, it's, it's trying to apply mathematical principles to biology because previously, biology has been biology, biology and medicine, and it's all got too difficult. But now, technology is enabling us to apply mathematics to biology. And if you can apply mathematics to it, you can start predicting various, uh, various things that you couldn't do before. So here we are. Drug companies packing up and moving out. In my area is lung disease, or Novartis in Sussex was a major research in lung disease. They've just closed down. Yeah, and we've just heard, of course, uh, that Pfizer are, are trying to take over AstraZeneca and Macclesfield and Cambridge. So that's another. And, and this is serious. I mean, this is terribly serious. Because if this goes on, we'll have no more new drugs. I mean, they'll just disappear. And it can't be uh, the long term. So let's try and see what's happening to compensate for that because a new model is, a bit, is emerging now. Now the old style when I was brought up in medicine, when I trained in London, is that you know, we had all this information that Osler and others were generating in their textbooks and we had to learn. Uh, then we took that information and used to uh, give it to patients in terms of what we thought was you know, reasonable advice about disease and that on, on the whole worked fairly well. The situation has changed enormously since the internet came in and since information technology now has empowered individual human beings to research themselves things about their own uh, conditions. And so quite often now they're able to come and see a doctor and they'll know more about the condition than the doctor will and that creates a very different sort of dynamic between the two individuals. And not only that, but we're looking now at managing patients through a sort of whole pathway, not just single diseases, have diabetes, give insulin. No, have diabetes, give insulin, but lifestyle and exercise and all these other things across the life course uh, is also now part of the uh, particular uh, paradigm. So the reason we have quite good treatments up until now is that people have observed things and research them along very specific directions. And this is the journey, which I've written there, of how medical research works. Something is observed in a particular disease, like diabetes, for example, someone observes that sugar is high, like Bantingham Best did in 1921. They generate a hypothesis. They then apply the science to that hypothesis. So if the hypothesis is that diabetes is due to a high blood sugar, then you're going to try and reduce that blood sugar. And then you uh, identify the pathways how you're going to do that and try to normalize it with drugs, produce a clinical trial and deliver a drug into practice. That's the, that's the normal way that we've got antihypertensive drugs and we've got antibiotics and we've got anti-diabetes and so on. That's the way drug development has happened. Largely on the back of the type of medicine I've talked about. But it's not delivering it in either your area or many other areas of medicine now. Because we don't know what the pathways are that are leading to these diseases. So this is the new revolution. And everyone talks about genetics and genomics. But since now we have access to technologies that can tell us not only about 
the genes, of which we have 33,000 of them in us, operating to orchestrate our whole bodies. But also, we can now measure all the consequences of those genes. And this is where the breakthrough is. So we can sequence, in any one of you, your genetic code, and that can be done for about £1,500 now, which is not expensive. But not only that, we can find out if you have a slight genetic abnormality, how that's translated through the cell to an abnormal cell function. And these are called transcriptomics, proteomics, and metabolomics. So these are the different levels of how a gene can read through to manifest in a cell to behave in a different way than it would normally behave. And that technology is now present here. We can do this in, in all diseases. It's made possible because of technology has uh, refined our ability to be able to do very complicated things very quickly and easily. So the human genome, when Craig Ventner first described the human genome um, some 15 to 20 years ago, cost $100 million to do that for his own genome. We're at $1,300 now to sequence any one of you in this room's genome. So that's what's happened. The technology has brought the price down. So this now is within the realms of any hospital or any organization. Okay? It's, it's made it a real possibility that we can use this information for gaining the benefit of health. And how do these impact upon better health? Well, this is a new way of, of medicine emerging. It's called personalized medicine. And because we're all made differently with our genes, and we all have different lifestyles, it's now possible to take an individual as opposed to a population and start beginning to ask the question, well, what is it about that one person that gives them these set of uh, problems or conditions? as opposed to what we used to do, which is to take hundreds and thousands of people in large populations. And it's called personalized medicine, because what you're trying to do here is develop a diagnostic test that you can give to that person to show precisely what's wrong, so that you can then treat that person with the particular agent that the diagnostic test is revealing is abnormal. So this is a little bit like uh, just taking one abnormality, your blood sugar being high in diabetes, therefore, having identified that, being able to give you a treatment that can bring the sugar down. But nowadays, they can do that for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different abnormalities simultaneously in an individual. We call it personalized medicine, which in a way is not the right word because it's, it gives you the feeling that it's kind of private medicine and it's all, you know, so better, I think, is predictive medicine, preventative medicine, and importantly here, participatory or participative, as the Americans say, medicine. That means the individual is participating in their own uh, diagnostic journey. I'm going to give you an example of what I mean before I go back to chronic fatigue syndrome and ME again. Okay? So let's just use the Osler model, which is the one we've come out of, Okay, from the 1860s onwards. And there we look at breast cancer or lung cancer, see it under the microscope, we have to say, yes, that's lung cancer, and we're going to try a series of treatments. What they can't do is say, well, the type of lung cancer that you've got is this type, and therefore the treatment you should have is this drug. Because that sort of approach won't give you the answer. So we've got now the opportunity, let's take cancer, cancer's a great example here, of taking a single tumor, a lung cancer or a breast cancer or whatever it is, taking the tumor and doing all those omics on that tumor, the genes, the transcriptome, the proteome, the metallome, okay? Following the abnormality now and identifying in that one tumor that's come out of this individual human being where the abnormality is, precisely incredibly precisely. And of course it started really, I mean breast cancer is a great example, because it started where breast cancer was all treated the same in the day when I was brought up as a medical student. 
you know, you had mastectomy and you had certain drugs. But now we know there are at least 15 different types of breast cancer that all look identical under the microscope. So you, you look at them and say, yes, yeah, it's breast cancer. But you wouldn't know there are, there are 15 different subtypes, and each subtype has got its own characteristic abnormalities. And therefore the treatment you would need needs to target the abnormality in each of those individual patients, not the whole population of breast cancer. And there's just very principally, uh, very easily we can just illustrate that with some of the drugs that are used to treat breast cancer, which tamoxifen of course is one of them, because it blocks the estrogen receptor, which occurs in about, I don't know, 35 to 40 percent of breast cancer. So that's just one example. But the other 60 percent won't have the estrogen receptor expressed. There's no good giving them tamoxifen because it won't work, because they don't have the receptor. So that's hormone positive breast cancer. We've got other examples in breast cancer, which I need to linger on. So let's take another example here. Now this is pancreatic cancer. This has got 100% mortality. It's a dreadful disease. If any of you have ever known anybody with pancreatic cancer, you, you know, you won't survive it. It's a terrible condition. And everybody thought pancreatic cancer was so difficult that it almost, you know, they, they give you surgery and try a few drugs and it didn't work. But now what they've done is do exactly the same with pancreatic cancer. They found out that there are 15 or 20 different gene mutations in the cancer, and that any one person may have combinations of these, two or three or four or five. And so you can have a person shown in green here with one set of mutations, completely different from somebody in red who has another set of mutations of their uh, DNA. And as a result of that, the treatment that you'll give the green and the red will be entirely different. And this is transforming cancer, absolutely changing it. It's a very, very exciting time to be in medicine now. So you can't read this and it doesn't matter, but along the top there are all the cancers. Brain cancer, skin cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, all the cancers. Along the bottom uh, side there are individual genetic abnormalities that have gone wrong, okay? And these are called signatures, they're, they're pathways that have gone wrong. And what I'm trying to illustrate here is that you can see that a number of these cancers share the same abnormalities. So that means a brain cancer and a breast cancer could share the same abnormalities. It's just happening in a different place. Therefore the treatment for the brain cancer and the breast cancer would be the same because the abnormality is very, very specific um, and you'll see them uh, shared there. Now this is a major breakthrough in cancer. It's a huge advance which is going to transform the way cancer is treated across the world now that they're doing this. So personalised medicine, well, that's a great example. Taking a tumour, looking at where the abnormalities are and then absolutely targeting the drugs on the abnormality in the tumour to reverse the tumour. Personalised medicine. And the European Science Foundation has recommended a number of ways that we need to build this into the health service generally now and to try and start moving forward in this direction. But what it means for me as a medical scientist is that instead of calling things under generic names, like liver cirrhosis or breast cancer or osteoporosis, we're going to have very specific causative pathways linked to these individual diseases. So for osteoporosis, for example, there may be 20 odd changes and that any human being who has osteoporosis may have two or three of them, which may differ from the two or three that your next door neighbour would have. And therefore identifying those pathways enables the practitioner to be able to treat the pathway. And that's going to create a new, what we call, taxonomy in medicine. So the Osler taxonomy is what we're in at the moment. That is describing disease with symptoms and pathology. The new taxonomy is going to be describing disease by causative pathways. Causative things inside cells that have gone wrong but are leading to the abnormality. 
So let me just give you one example in my own world. Okay? Now here is a disease called cystic fibrosis. Dreadful disease. I mean, any family who has a child with this knows that for the next 30 years there's going to be you know, really great problems. One of the genetic mutations was discovered in this cystic fibrosis, which has a prevalence of 23% in Northern Ireland, okay, although only 3% across the whole cystic fibrosis population. And they were able to develop a drug because they knew exactly what went wrong with the receptor, with the transporter, and they were able to put, put a drug in which could return that transporter to normal. And shown on the right-hand side is a graph of uh, young adults and children who were given this treatment. And within about a week to 10 days, the disease stopped, cystic fibrosis. Now, who would ever have believed that, that cystic fibrosis, a genetic disease that's a killer, could be stopped in its tracks by restoring this particular trans uh, transporter to normal? That's the sort of curative approach to medicine that's now becoming available by understanding these pathways, okay? And that things that we never thought could ever be achieved are going to be achieved. Muscular dystrophy will be treated because they'll find out exactly how to restore the genetic abnormality and, and many other diseases. It's single gene diseases like cystic fibrosis and muscular dystrophy, you know, it's easy to give examples. But again, it's a bit like the cancer thing. It's understanding the molecular abnormality that leads to the particular disease. So I've just put this uh, diagram up because what we're going to be able to do and are beginning to do now, and cancer's leading the way, but it's coming into our other field, is to get all these omics interactions working together to identify these pathways. And then that will create a new disease causation or pathway specific mechanism, give you a diagnostic test, enable a very specific treatment to begin, and then a good health, come, uh, health outcome to follow. And by feeding this incredible circle, one is going to be able to refine at an individual human being's basis uh, the treatments that uh, that individual needs. So, I'm just going to show you this. I'm involved in managing something called the National Phenome Centre at Imperial College. So this is, a, this is used in the Olympic Games to analyse drugs in urine and blood during the sports, uh, you know, during the Olympic Games. And they gave Imperial College the equipment, and it's been refined a lot. And what this equipment can now do is to take a urine sample or a blood sample, do an incredibly complex analysis Okay, within seconds almost, and then give you a pathway which is shown at the bottom on the right uh, of a particular disease. To just give you uh, uh, another example, I mean, cutting a brain tumor out of a child's brain is a difficult thing to do. You don't want to leave any tumor in there, and you don't want to damage the normal brain. So, what they've done using this sort of approach, this omics, is to analyze the vapor that comes off from the cautery knife instantly for the chemicals in it and use a computer to go around the tumour and as soon as it goes out of the tumour into normal brain it changes the uh, profile and is able to with great precision cut out the brain tumour without leaving any tumour tissue behind in the brain at all. So this is what the technology now is able to start delivering for us and it's a very very wonderful world that we're entering into. I mean the challenge really is being able to integrate the different levels of information. And I think that now is being put together in the United Kingdom. We have something called the FAR Institute, which is a big computer-driven system which can integrate this complex data which is coming out of all of these studies to enable us to identify these pathways. And we store the data, of course, within uh, computers, in the cloud, and you you've got this amazing ability to store this massive amount of information which is going to give us the insight into these causative uh, diseases. So in a way, the, I suppose the Holy Trinity, and here we are in the, in the church here, the Holy Trinity of biology is being kind of challenged now because the biology of uh, interactions is, is analyzable and is 
It can be mathematically programmed and predicted. And I think that incredible cross-disciplinarity that's coming into biology and medicine, with all this computation, with all these uh, omics technology, is giving us the green light now to go into these complicated diseases. And what it'll do is, do is it'll enable us to actually study wellness. You know, when somebody feels well, what does that mean? I mean, you know what it means when you don't feel well, but sometimes you can't put a word on it because you just don't feel well. But to be able to quantify some of these things will be possible. And of course, we can demystify some diseases. And in some ways, it, living in this new world that biology is moving into, it's like studying systems biology. On the left hand side is a yeast cell where one stimulus, just one little stimulus has been given to that cell. It could be heat, it could be a drug, it could be an acid or whatever. But anyway, the stimulus. And you can see all the pathways that were activated inside that cell when that one stimulus was applied. If we go to a human cell, that's a human kidney cell, which is that one there, on the next one, you'll see how much more complicated that is. One stimulus, same one, massive interactions in the cell, all these networks are all talking to each other, and then the cell will behave in a different way. And if any one of those goes wrong, then the cell won't behave normally. <coughs> well, if you take a, a condition like ME, then you can go one level higher than the cell and talk about organs all interacting together, the brain, the adrenal gland, the muscle, the, you know, all the different parts. And you've got this incredible crosstalk between all these organs. And no wonder, you know, patients have different manifestations of these different of, the, of this condition, because the emphasis in any individual, depending on the pathways which are abnormal, will differ. Some will have sleep problems, others will have a lot of pain, others you know, will have cognition problems or whatever. But the actual interaction there uh, can now be studied because we have the biological tools to do it, whereas a few years ago we didn't. So this is one of these wordles, uh, and it's interesting when you look at that, how many different components ME might have. Many of you in this room will recognize those symptoms, those conditions, uh, and I needn't linger on them. And any one of you will be individual in terms of which one of those manifests through you uh, in that particular condition. So, coming to the close of now, as I finish, and I'm going to end in a more optimistic tone, is that we are talking here about a highly complicated set of interactions. So we're not talking about a disease anymore. Uh, that doesn't help us. We're talking about this complex interaction between different components of the human body, the cell, and inside the cell, right the way down to the DNA. And the key to understanding this and developing diagnostic tests will be to understand what those interactions are, to understand those pathways, just as in cancer, they've been able to unpick it because they've understood precisely which pathway has gone wrong in any particular patient. So why is it good now? Well, I, I <coughs> needn't read all that really. We did a, a very uh, exciting thing in the Medical Research Council about four or five years ago. We said, look, there's no research in this area worth writing about because it's all of low quality. So let's try and create a different atmosphere. So what we did is we brought ME scientists, of which there were very few, with other scientists who were researching into the human brain or into pain or into sleep or whatever, brought them together. They came up with some wonderful new ideas and we had a funding round and very high level proposals came in. We funded five of them and they'll be reported, reported fairly soon. But all one of them, every one of them, is around trying to understand what we call the endotype. That is the causative pathways that are making up this chronic fatigue syndrome ME complex. Okay? Trying to understand what it is using the technologies I've just described. So where do we go from here? Well, the reason I'm here really is that I'm really keen on this approach to medicine. I think this is the way the future is going to be. 
we've got to work together in medical sciences to address the complexity of this condition. And we're going to need different scientists to do that. We're going to need engineers and mathematicians as well as biologists and medical people to really help us put this complex series of uh, events together. We're going to have to move away now from the competitive side of medical research because we can't go down that route anymore. It's too expensive, it's too difficult, it's a waste of energy and resource. And what we've got to try and do is to bring the scientists together with the medical people and the patients and work together on this uh, project. We've got to obviously prioritise where we go with this and we can talk a bit about that during the discussion if you like. And we've got to train some new scientists to do it. So, the reason why I think this will work is that we've done that uh, in the lung area, because I had that same problem in the lung area, so we brought all organisations together in that room, and we got them to start prioritising and working collaboratively to try and see if we could get more funding and get more successful grants. And you'll see prior to 2005, when I came in to, to start doing this, see what's happened to the funding for the area. It dramatically increased because now we're starting to get high quality proposals from the best scientists in the land coming in you know, with things that are going to make a difference. And that's what we actually need in this area. We need the best scientists to be involved. And that's why I thought the time was right uh, in, uh, in the 22nd 2013 to 2012, uh, to launch, no, 2013, to launch the collaborative. And this is, some of you may have gone to it, I don't know, it was in London, it was at the Welcome, uh, the Welcome Collection, and we had the presentations and so on. This is all the charities, the Medical Research Council, the Department of Health, the Welcome Trust, coming together around this disease area and saying we've got to do things together better to get the science up so we can start making some advances. We've had our first executive meeting over a year ago now and the partnership is now beginning to move. And we need a charter to be able to do this. So what we've done is that we've created a charter and we want all the British researchers, no matter what they're researching into, providing they're active and serious, to come and join us on this journey so that we've got them all together in a place like this and we can learn from them and interact with them. And that's what we're, we're doing. So this is what the charter is. I will go through it. You can see what it's all about. It's about building up the infrastructure, basically, to do this sort of research that I've been describing to you. And that sort of research is going to require tremendous cooperation from the patients on one side to the highly sophisticated scientists on the other, all working together try and achieve this. The funding, well it's obviously going to be difficult, but we're getting there. New funds are coming into this now, and I'll show you, uh, not this year, uh, sorry, um, in September at our first national meeting, what's happened to funding since we started this, in this area. The MRC, the Department of Health, the NHR, the Welcome Trust are all putting money into this now because it's starting to get serious, and that's absolutely fantastic. Uh, we've got membership and associate membership, and we've got our conference, which I hope you'll come to, some of you. I mean, we've got this conference in Bristol where we've got a whole day of science, but then we've got half a day for patients and carers to come and interrogate the scientists about what they're doing and hopefully help join us on this uh, journey. So, I'll end really uh, by saying I think the future in this area now has to be rewritten by the new technology being brought in. And to be able to do that, we need patience, we need your cooperation, we need your help. Because the only way it will be done is by studying patients themselves, not by studying some model or some in vitro system. It will have to come by studying the real disease. So we need to come together. The second thing is that we've got to grow the capacity to do research. So we've got to take scientists who are brilliant in other areas of medical science and bring them into our area. That's what we've got to try and do. And we're starting to do that. 
And believe you me, money is a great driver uh, when it comes to attracting sound. So if you get more money, that's great. And then, of course, we need to engage these communities together. And I don't just mean medical scientists and patients. I'm talking here about computer scientists and engineers and different people who look at this systems approach in a way that we've never been able to look at it before and come up with some mathematical paradigms enabling us to develop these diagnostic tests which are proving to be so successful in some other diseases like cancer. And unless we actually start working in that uh, way, we're not going to be able to do it. So I would just like to end by saying the influence of the whole is going to be greater than the sum of the parts, because the parts so far have not delivered the goods. So the only way we can really do this is by joining forces and seeing if we can move forward. I implore you to come to our meeting, which will be in Bristol. I know all of you are going to come, but some of you might be able to might like to be able to send the representatives. Come and spend a day and a half with us and, and see what the science is doing. Because they're going to demonstrate to you what they're actually studying. And I think you'll find it an amazingly enlightening experience because it's very different to where it was a few years ago. Thank you very much.